Congratulations, true crime addicts. We've survived another week. It is Friday, September 29th, 2023. This week, Crystal Rogers' husband has been charged with murder, a Philly mob versus Lululemon, and an update in the Andrew Gosden case. All this and more. Stay tuned. Yes. Super excited. We are all pumped to have James Author Renner. James Renner. On. That James Renner has zeroed in. James on. Renner's once again drops a bombshell. Investigative James journalist Renner. reporter James Renner. James Renner, who's been James on the podcast Renner. a long time. Local writer, James Renner. James Renner. All right. Thanks for tuning in to True Crime This Week with James Renner. Oh, my belt didn't work. That's not a good omen. Uh, that's me. Uh, well, thank you for showing up. And as always, I want to thank Walter uh, for manning the camera. Walter's just back from his uh, ayahuasca experience in Yellow Springs, Ohio. Uh, hey, if you happen to like this show, take a moment, give it a little star or two. I'm not, uh, you know, I don't ask for much. Maybe three stars if you really like it, uh, but but go on and you know, that that stuff helps. It helps us jump up and you know get more views and, and all that. Um, being from the Midwest, I hate to ask you to do that, but if you could, let's jump to the top stories in true crime this week that you might have missed that you absolutely should know about. Uh, Baltimore, Baltimore is mourning the death of a promising young tech CEO this week. The body of 26-year-old Pava LaPere was discovered on the roof of her apartment building on Monday morning. LaPere was the CEO of Ecomap Technologies, and which she co-founded in college, by the way. That's how, that's how smart she was. Uh, she was featured in Forbes' annual 30 Under 30 list. Her company published data maps and had recently announced that it had raised $8 million from venture venture capital firms, according to the Baltimore Sun. LaPere had been reported missing for a couple days before police found her body on the roof. It appeared she'd suffer from blunt force trauma. Now, it didn't take long for police to hone in on a suspect. The details are still kind of sparse at this point, but they got, got to him. They figured out who, who likely did it pretty quickly. And that led to a manhunt. Uh, here's how it worked out. On Tuesday, Baltimore police held a press conference and announced that a 32-year-old convicted felon named James Billingsley was a suspect in her murder. They warned the public that he was armed and dangerous and that he was also a suspect in a recent rape and attempted murder of an entire family. Billingsley has a very long rap sheet, including a 2015 conviction for a first-degree sex offense for which he was sentenced to 30 years in prison with 14 years suspended, but somehow he managed to get released for that crime in 2022 after serving just seven years. Since then, he's been under weekly supervision by a sex offender agent, but he skipped his treatment session on September 19th, and that was reported. I think the police started to look at him uh, back then, and then he murdered LaPere. U.S. Marshals were tracking his phone. Police apprehended him at a train station Wednesday night. <clears throat> the boyfriend of Crystal Rogers, a young mother of five who went missing in 2015, was arrested this week and charged with her murder, according to CBS News. I've seen this case pop up a lot on Reddit. A lot of people were following the disappearance of Crystal Rogers. She remains missing, by the way. Uh, no remains have been found yet, but it sounds like they kind of figured out what happened. Crystal disappeared from her home in Bardstown, Kentucky on July 3rd, 2015. At the time, she was living with her boyfriend, Brooks Houck, and he was the last person known to have seen her. When he was questioned at the time, Houck said he saw Crystal playing games on her cell phone before he went to bed. Then he woke up, she was gone, her car was gone. Two days later, Crystal's car was found by mile marker 14 on the Bluegrass Highway. The car had a flat tire, keys were still in the ignition, and her purse and cell phone were inside. Now, from the start, police suspected Houck, but lacked evidence to secure an indictment. For one, he never bothered to search for her. 
just always suspicious, you know? Uh, when he was brought in for questioning, his brother Nick, who worked for the Bardstown police, called him and told him to stop talking. Because of his interference, Nick was fired from the department. A white Buick was seen parked at the Hauk farm the night Crystal disappeared. Police now believe that Buick was owned by Hauk's grandmother. Not that she was involved in the crime, of course, but that they used the car in the process of committing this, this crime. That car was sold a short time later, and the grandmother has maybe testified in front of a grand jury. There's, uh, but some of that's been sealed. <clears throat> then on November 19th, November 19th, 2016, Crystal's father was shot and killed while he was out hunting. The police ruled that it was not a suicide as his gun has not, had not been fired. Somebody else shot him dead while he was hunting on the property. They may be looking at Hauk for that murder as well. Just a couple weeks ago, a 32-year-old man named Joseph Lawson, who's also from Bardstown, was arrested and charged with conspiracy to commit murder and tampering with evidence. Now, the police haven't formally said this yet, but it appears they believe he's connected to the case as well. Halk is currently being held on a $10 million bond, meaning he will likely remain in jail until the trial. And finally, 52 people were arrested on Tuesday after flash mobs in Philadelphia looted several stores in the area, according to the Associated Press. Police say the looting was an organized attack fueled by social media. Now, here's kind of why they think it happened. Earlier that day, a Philadelphia judge dismissed all criminal charges against our officer, Mark Dial, for shooting and killing 27-year-old Eddie Irizarry during a traffic stop in August. At first, police, police said that uh, the young man, uh, Irizarry, had stepped out of the car and was threatening police with a knife. But they later had to change that story when the journalist got hold of the body cam footage, which showed, no, nah, he didn't get out of the car after all. Following this, the dismissal of the charges against Dial, Philly residents took to Instagram asking, quote, what time we go shopping, and quote, we looting or not, end quote, according to the Philly Inquirer. <clears throat> a short time later, a mob, of, a mob of people ransacked several stores downtown, including Foot Locker, Lululemon, and Apple. 18 liquor stores were also vandalized. Now, this is becoming an increasingly more and more common thing. Similar mobs have looted stores in San Francisco recently, focusing on high-end products. Target, not to be confused with high-end products, Target even announced this week that it was closing nine stores in four states due to similar events. Ironically, charges against Officer Dial were refiled. He was recharged only hours later on Tuesday. He faces life in prison for Irizarry's murder. Now, I think we can all agree looting is a crime and should be punished, but maybe... Just maybe these people are, and what's been going on is a symptom of a bigger problem. And they found a way to be heard after incidents where police shoot and kill members of their community. It's also a clear sign, I think, of the major wealth disparity happening in America right now. Have you been to a Lululemon? That shit is pricey. And the majority of folks in this country are living pay paycheck to paycheck while executives and CEOs continue to make billions. Eventually, we should begin to realize this is not, we should begin to look at this not as like an isolated crime of opportunity, but what it really is, which is blue collar workers revolting against a system that keeps them poor and in the crosshairs of white police officers. That's my stump speech for this week. Um, lots more coming up. I have that update in the Andrew Gosden case. Uh, there's an update in Laura Cook case that I mentioned last week that's pretty bonkers. And, uh, and lots more. It's some weird news you got to hear. I'll be right back in 2 and 2 with more true crime this week. Please hang up and try again. And we're back with Wise Guy starring Ken Wall. 
The two men who were arrested last year in connection to the disappearance of Andrew Gosden were released this week and are no longer suspected of having anything to do with the crime, according to the Yorkshire Post. Andrew Gosden was 14 years old in 2007 when he left his home in Doncaster, withdrew 200 pounds from his bank account, and hopped a train to London. He was last seen on security cameras leaving King's Cross Station. His, sto his story has since become one of the most well-known unsolved mysteries in recent history. To this day, nobody knows where Andrew was going, or why, or what happened to him when he got there. Two men were arrested last year, suspected of being connected to the disappearance. Now, this is kind of a weird tradition in the UK. Apparently, their law allows police to detain someone without charging them if they believe doing so may preserve evidence, and that's what happened in this case. These guys had just been chilling out in jail. Apparently, they had nothing to do with it. They lost a year of their lives. Andrew's parents released a statement saying, quote, Our hearts go out to the men who feel... Um, I'm sorry, our hearts go out to the men who have been exonerated of any involvement in Andrew's disappearance. We feel profoundly sorry for their inevitable distress that such allegations have caused, end quote. It's a really nice statement from the family in light of what happened to these men. Lauren Cook, do you remember this story from last week? She went missing last week with her three kids. And everybody was wondering, is she dead? Did, you know, or is this the worst case scenario? What happened to the kids? Well, she appeared this week. Well, not really appeared, appeared by phone, I guess. She gave an interview with The Messenger on Wednesday, telling the outlet that her kids are safe and they're not missing. She says she took them on a pre-planned out-of-state vacation. Perhaps not coincidentally, the Department of Social Services in Franklin County, Virginia, where they live, were investigating her family for child abuse and neglect, as well as drug use and mental illness when they disappeared. Now, Lauren's husband says the investigation was launched after an anonymous threat or an anonymous tip, and they are keeping their kids out of Franklin County so they're not put into foster care. Both parents deny the allegation. I haven't heard a story quite like that. This week, L.A. County District Attorney George Gascone held a press conference to accept responsibility for his department's role in putting an innocent man in prison for decades. This coming from CNN. Earlier this year, Gerardo Cabanillas was released from prison after 28 years when DNA tests revealed he was not the man who kidnapped and raped a woman in 1995. He was arrested back then for kind of looking like one of the men who robbed a couple at gunpoint and then assaulted the woman. Cabanillas was only 18 years old at the time, and he was coerced into making a false confession after a detective promised him that if he just admitted to the crime, he'd be released on probation. So he admitted to it, and instead he was sent to prison for 28 years. By then it was too late to tell the truth. In 2019, the California Innocence Project filed a motion to have DNA evidence tested. The results of that testing were linked to a very different man, who was already serving time in prison for committing other rapes and murders. Cabanillas is one of the thousands now who have been exonerated after falsely confessing to crimes they did not commit. Police often pressure suspects to confess by offering them deals like they did in this case. I'm personally interested in this story because I delve deeper into the subject of false confessions in the new season of The Philosophy of Crime, my other podcast, The New episodes should start appearing in October. Yesterday, Colorado police announced that the remains of Suzanne Morphew were discovered about 50 miles from where she disappeared on Mother's Day in 2020, according to CNN. Morphew had gone on a bike ride that day near Maysville and never returned home. Her remains were found last Friday while officers were searching an area in Sawatch County, for an unrelated investigation. They were looking for something else that came across her remains. Morphew's husband, Barry, was charged with her murder in 2021, but prosecutors asked the court to dismiss the case last year when they continued, while they continued to search for her. And they did that in such a way that they could refile charges against Barry if they find that he's connected to her death. Barry's lawyer adamantly says he's innocent and their family is grieving. Got some weird news for you this week that's uh, weird but also kind of disturbing. 
A British man was stabbed to death in Portugal last Sunday while playing the Blue Whale suicide game, according to Metro. A 26-year-old man had already, has already confessed to the crime. The victim is a 35-year-old man and apparently died while playing this weird game, this Blue Whale suicide game, during a party. For those that didn't know, that don't know, I didn't know, uh, Blue Whale is, is some weird game that began as kind of a social media meme in 2016. It involves a series of tasks assigned to a player over a 50-day period. Now, the, the tasks begin innocently enough, uh, but they get increasingly dangerous as time goes by. And the final challenge is suicide. So, congratulations, you're dead, I guess. Uh, Russian media has reported that up to 130 teenagers have died playing this game, though this number is almost certainly inflated by a kind of hysterical panic where people are trying to link suicides to this online prank. A 21-year-old psychology student claimed he invented the game in 2013 to, quote, clean society of biological wastes, end quote. He was arrested and sent to Kresty Kres Prison, which is in Russia, where you really, really, really don't want to go to prison. In my childhood, the only game that I played that made me want to commit suicide was Monopoly. Anyway, uh, <laughs> over to pop culture. Um, my recommendation this week, I, I, it kind of flew under the radar for me. Maybe it did for you too. Maybe you've already seen it. But yeah, if you haven't, check out Myth of the Zodiac Killer. The identity of the Zodiac Killer has confounded investigators for over 50 years, but an unconventional character may have cracked America's most famous cold case by asking whether he ever existed in the first place. The idea is that these separate murders were separate crimes committed by different people, and this person that came out and called himself Zodiac that sent all these ciphers was essentially like the first social media troll. You see this a lot online. I saw it a lot in the Moore Murray case, where the more you talked about the case, the more these weirdos would come out. And they would send these weird puzzle games and ciphers to try to just cause chaos. So the thought is maybe this is what happened with the Zodiac case. Myth of the Zodiac Killer, check it out. I believe it's on Hulu. Uh, and the book for this week... It comes out October 3rd, so in, in well, next week. Wow, time, time flies. So um, I believe that's Tuesday. Anyways, new book. You got to read. Check it out. Uh, I'm going to get a copy. It's called In Light of All Darkness. Here's the write-up. Paced like a thriller and full of insider information on the history and science of crime scene investigation, In Light of All Darkness embeds readers in one of the most famous true crime stories of our generation, The Kidnapping of Polly Class. A case as pivotal in the history of, F of the FBI as the Unabomber and Oklahoma City. On October 1st, 1993, a 12-year-old girl was kidnapped at knife point from her bedroom in Petaluma, California during a sleepover with two friends. While her mother slept soundly in the next room, the rarest of all kidnapping, a stranger abduction from the home, triggered one of the largest manhunts in FBI history. Many remember Polly's face, which appeared on the national news every night on the cover of People magazine, and on more than 8 million flyers distributed as far away as China. The emo emotional gravity of Polly's story touched every agent, police officer, and forensic technician who worked the case. Many of these investigators have never shared their story until now. New York Times bestselling author Kim Cross has written the first comprehensive account of what happened on that fateful night in October as well as how the case forever transformed the Bureau's approach to solving crimes. With unprecedented access to case files, crime scene photos, and videotape murder confession, and inside sources, In the Light of Darkness follows the investigators who pieced together the evidence and made the victim a household name and a girl who will never be forgotten. Big case, big book, check it out. And that's the story for this week. That's the news in true crime. And uh, it's the weekend, so go celebrate. You don't get these uh, all the time. It's going to be winter soon here in Ohio. Go enjoy the day. And in the words of the incomparable Murray Saul, the godfather of Cleveland Radio, we got to, 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 get down, damn it. 
True Crime This Week is a fearful symmetry production. Photo and artwork are licensed through Shutterstock. If you like the cut of my jib, I have another podcast you might enjoy called The Philosophy of Crime, in which I attempt to solve the big questions behind our true crime obsession by looking to philosophy for answers. Thank you for listening. I'll see you next week. Sit, Brownie, sit. Good dog.